that or not. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, assuming I can get it up and going, I'll keep an eye on it. Okay. I mean, I could pull it up too, but um, but I don't know. I mean, it just seems like the way this window is working, uh, it might be better for you. Um, we can take some questions in there. If you if you keep that chat window open, then and alert me to any questions, just interrupt me or whatever. That would be amazing. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I can see it. I'll see if I can get it running here. So one of the amazing things about you, as I've often said, is that sometimes I can out outsource my brain to you. You know, so um, I'm hoping you can give me a full tutorial on this on this uh, Seymour Hersh uh, Bin Laden stuff. Some of the background, some of what's been going on, because I know you've—I I mean, I know you, so I know you've been following it very, very closely, right? Um, uh, where, yeah, as, of course. you know, I'm—I've been involved in all these other things going on. And I still haven't read the Hirsch article. I have a, a vague outline of what's happening. I mean, how serious is this for for the empire? How credible is the story? What does it mean for, uh, you know, this the sort of historical narrative of of the U.S. you know uh, capture of, of Bin Laden? Well, so I think I want to start with that, and I'm still screwing around trying to get the chat room open here uh, while I'm okay. talking to you, but I think I want to start with that. The reaction to Hirsch, I mean, all you need to know is that there's the official story of the killing of bin Laden, and Hirsch has come out with this piece that says that it's virtually entirely a lie, that that's not how it happened at all, that he died there that day, but other than that, it's all a bunch of bunk. And then the reaction to that, is like he, you know, said that the Virgin Mary was in fact not a virgin at all. Like, right? He had he had gone straight at the heart of the civic religion of the state. I mean, what is it good for anyway? Well, they did hunt down and kill that one guy finally, right? And so we can cheer USA for that. And I don't know where they got the the students to come out in front of the White House and chant USA for that, but they found him. And um, it's hurtful. Jeff Tucker, it, it's hurtful to say that something as, as important and symbolic as the Navy SEALs, right, SEAL Team 6 and all this straight out of the comic book, that they went and got this guy in the way that they did um, in this, uh, you know, Jessica Lynch heroic, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Special Forces raid kind of a way that they did. Does this all and, come from the movie? Does this all from the, the movie Z Zero Dark? Something. Sure. Yeah, and I mean the lies were tailor made for a movie, basically, right? This is, um, uh, you know, basically to make up for the fact that everything they do makes our terrorism problem worse. At least they could say, well, we finally got that one guy for you, I guess. Anyway, the only point I'm getting at is look at the way they attack Hirsch. All right. I mean, no, none of these reporters ever attack each other like this for carrying on the state's narrative. But you challenge the state's narrative, and from a position of such authority as being Seymour Hirsch, who's you know the daddy of all real investigative journalists in this country, and they all know it. They all have to praise him before they attack him, even when they're attacking him. Um, it, it was it's a huge thing. I mean, you know, his story that uh, Turkey and Al Nusra uh, were basically trying to frame up Assad for the Serenit gas attack of August 2013. Um, that almost led to a war then, they basically just ignored that. And that was a big deal story. But they basically just ignored it right out of there. Let's just pretend that never happened, basically. That didn't make the TV news or whatever. But with this Bin Laden story, it uh, I guess I'm just repeating myself. But you can see how you know people in the media uh, just went completely crazy over this because they played the role of Mina Bird for whatever the state said happened there, and including, like you said, the Hollywood movie that depicts this entire thing uh, entirely different from the so what, truth. So what, what, is, what, is what is his narrative, and, and how does it differ from, differ from the okay, so, official right, story? Okay, so uh, the official story is that the CIA brilliantly tortured a guy and then that led to the name of a courier, and then they tracked a courier to this Bin Laden safe house in Abbottabad, and that uh, uh, the, uh, the Americans basically just figured it out, deduced that he was there, and then knowing they couldn't trust the ISI that may or may not have been in on keeping him there, the ISI, that's the Pakistani CIA, basically, uh, they decided to send in the special forces... SEAL Team 6 in two Black Hawk helicopters to raid the place 
and kill the guy. There was a big firefight. They shot a bunch of couriers and bodyguards and whatever. And then all the details, they even from the very beginning, they were raising and then dropping details as they were disproven and contradicted. But they said for a time he had hid behind his wife and that he had fired an AK-47 and all of this. So what Hirsch says is that basically none of that's true. He was living there, but he was living there because ISI was keeping him there under house arrest. And that one of their uh, top guys basically broke ranks and walked into the CIA and said, I know where bin Laden is, give me the money and bring my, my family to America and I'll tell you where he is. And then he tipped them off. And that then uh, they worked, they basically called out the Saudis. I mean, pardon me, the Pakistanis, and said, we know that you've been keeping him, and so now you're going to help us get him. And so then they went in and did the raid, but it was basically stage-managed, like the Jessica Lynch thing, where there was no opposition in sight. And the Pakistanis kept all the airplanes back and didn't do anything about the helicopters violating the air, their airspace and kept all the local police and local firefighters and local whatever first responders and, and that kind of thing back from the scene during the raid. They went in there and they shot him, and then instead of uh, dumping his body at sea, they actually, the, the, the uh, SEALs themselves were, according to Hirsch, kind of just joshing around and going, ha-ha, look at me, oops, I accidentally threw his hand out the door, hard for you to get a proper Islamic burial now, huh, chump, kind of thing, and that they were basically just desecrating his body through, through bits and pieces of it out the door, and then... There's a discrepancy here because he says in the article, or at least his copy editor, Final Draft, says in the article, the body was last seen with the CIA and that the burial at sea on the Vinson never happened. The USS Vinson, Carl Vinson, never happened. Um, when I asked him about that, he said, I didn't write that. I don't know what you're talking about. Now I got to go. So oh, really? I don't know exactly. I guess, in fact, what he said was, no, it did go to the Vinson, but it didn't go into the water. What do you mean when you when you asked him about that? Did you have him on your show? Yeah, I had him on my show a week ago today. Oh, that's so incredibly cool. How did you uh, land that? I mean, you just wrote him? Well, yeah, I've kind of interviewed him off and on for the last 10 years because oh, he was wow. really good on, on the neocons and the Mujahideen Ecolk and all this great stuff back, you know, in 2005. And the that's wife so is friends cool. with him. And so, um, and now, so here's the thing, too. Uh, his story is partially corroborated by um, uh, Carlotta Gall from the New York Times, who says that was her information, too, that she never published, uh, but that she believed that the Pakistanis were keeping him there, basically under house arrest. Um, and then there's uh, another story that was published, actually back in 2011, by a blogger named uh, Hill House, who had said that, you know, basically the same story. And then NBC News and The National in Pakistan also came out and said it was not the courier. Never mind that it was torturing a guy into naming a courier. That's talk about a bridge too far. That's completely made up. And they're saying no, it wasn't even a courier at all. It was uh, this walk-in from the Pakistani ISI. So that's partial cooperation. And, I mean, the um, whole story sounds sounds. I mean, just just to hearing you tell it, it's, it sounds much more normal and much more, um, you know, sort of. Like a, like plausible, you know. I mean, that's sort of the yeah, way. Yeah, because stuff how do you how do you fly in two Blackhawks and then eventually two more helicopters, Chinooks, you know, the big double helicopters, uh, troop carrier things. How do you do that without having the the generals in charge of the Pakistani military on the phone and saying, right. "Listen, don't shoot down our helicopters, or we're going to be really pissed off, man." I mean, that they're they're not going to take that kind of risk of sneaking in there and doing it. And then, so Hirsch says, you know, the Pakistanis had their own incentives for playing down their role. The Americans wanted to blame the Pakistanis. They didn't mind because they were double-crossing the Saudis who'd been paying them to keep bin Laden. And, uh, and they were double-crossing al-Qaeda who they were keeping bin Laden. That was part of Hirsch's version anyway, was that they were basically saying to uh, al-Qaeda and the Pakistani Taliban, we've got your guy so you better not cross too many of our lines or whatever because we'll kill them kind of thing. And so since they had double-crossed them to both the Saudis and the, the local Al-Qaeda types, they decided they would go along with the American narrative that it was this big heroic mission and all of this. So apparently, and, and so after he publishes the story, and I, I, I read too about 
the New York Times reporter and, and several others saying, yeah, some version of that has sort of been on the street for a while, but, but nobody published it uh, mm -hmm. until now. So that's very interesting to me that the people who are sort of paid to know things and paid to write things and, and the, their life is, is this world. You know, would have would have heard this story for a while. I mean, even for them, uh, the Seymour Hersh story was not a revelation, really. I mean, that right. that's that's kind of, I mean, that that's really interesting to me. Um, I mean, I'm intrigued by that. You know, just just how something can be like a convention among the professionals that never enters into the the public that doesn't enter into the public uh, well, mind. You know what it is. Every, everybody talks about it. You know, sort of a cocktail parties and that sort of thing. Right. Through well, whispers. you know, I can't speak for Carlotta Gall and, and and New York Times reporters and that kind of thing. But my wife is an investigative reporter, and you know, part of the thing is there's a lot of things that she knows that she can't report because she promised that she wouldn't report it if they would tell her on background this right. or that kind of thing. Then there are other things that she thinks she knows, but she only has one good source, and she can't go with one good source. She'd have to wait until she has somebody else to tell her. And she might even, you know, she has to second guess herself too. If she thinks she has, like, like for example, Carlotta Gall is saying, well, I think that, okay, maybe I'm putting words in her mouth, but more or less she's saying, I didn't have enough to publish this myself, but I can help corroborate Hirsch, right? Yeah. Well, the question is raised there. Maybe Hirsch heard this from the same people as her. And so maybe right. she's actually not cooperating him. Maybe she's actually just doubling up on the same story. So it can be complicated, right? Yeah, and in yeah. fact, I'll go ahead and tell this story here because uh, what the hell, I don't care. I hope I don't get you know cause too much of a problem. I talked about it on the radio show. But my wife actually had this story, uh, major parts of this story, Jeff, right after it happened in the spring of 2011. And I actually have the story that she submitted to Raw's story and that they rejected and didn't publish. And then right. for different reasons, she basically, you know, gave up on journalism at that point and didn't publish it anywhere. Yeah. The story, it didn't have about the courier or the lack of courier, but it did have the part about uh, the Pakistanis were in on the raid and helped coordinate the raid with the Americans, helped uh, turn off the electricity in the town, and in fact even turn the lights off periodically for a month leading up to it so that when the lights went off that night, it wouldn't be that alarming of a thing kept the local uh, uh, local police and first responders back. And then also, and I guess um, she didn't have this part of the story written yet. This was supposed to be part two. But she also had that the Saudis were paying protection money, basically, to the Pakistanis to keep them there. But that, yeah, and, and well, and, oh, and that, first of all, that the Pakistanis, some at least factions of the ISI, were keeping him there. So I bring that up not to brag about her, but in context... I mean, yeah, I do get to brag about her that she actually had this story first, even though it's kind of silly to do so because it's not published, so I can't really brag about her having it because it's not a published story. But I tell you that to explain part of the problem of having editors and part of the problem of having anonymous sources and maybe not enough of them. Well, and and you know, also, it, it also does help, I think, to corroborate Hirsch's story because uh, Larissa had it uh, sure. with like three months before that blogger Hill House ever came out with well, it. So. There's, a, there's also an element here, you know, when something, when, when a conventional narrative becomes sort of part of, of a civic doctrine, you know, um, you know, big time movie, everybody believes it, there's, there's an element of uncertainty and fear associated with sort of contradicting that, you know? Um, yeah, yeah I, can, I, I, I can tell you, um, um, this is, Totally trivial example, but but I remember um, in the, the college I attended my, my senior year, the old main, uh, which is the main building on campus, uh, burned down, and uh, everybody immediately uh, suspected the president. Uh, but it was an insurance fraud case because the university was deeply in debt, and um, and everybody corroborated that story. I mean, like like. All the professors in the university believed it. Uh, it was always a whispering campaign, and basically everybody knows that that was true. You know, I mean, you know, basically everybody believed that he burned it down, and there there was every reason. There was a ton of evidence that, that he had. But what was amazing about this, um, and it, I mean, this is going way back in, in my personal history, 
but the speculation to that effect never once appeared in any public venue. I mean, the, the local paper never, the editorial never said that this is the rumor on the street. There's never an article in the newspaper. It was never discussed on the radio. I mean, so for the for the hoi polloi, uh, for all they knew, it was electrical fire. But but anybody who was anywhere close to the situation knew that the president of the university had burned it down. I and mean, to this day, you know, nobody talks about it. There was, there was even a, a uh, uh, years later, a, a piece of historical fiction was written by a professor at the university that had the president burning down the building. So, you know, I mean, uh, or a, a fictional college campus in which the president of the university... But, so it was a very early lesson to me to how something can become a conventional uh, sort of narrative um, for public consumption, and yet all the insiders sort of know that it's fake and have some version of the real story, and yet it never enters into public life you know, at all, through a, through a very complex dynamic of sort of fear, um, betrayal of sources, uh, lack of people uh, willing to go, you know, public with things, and so on and so on. So, it's it's just fascinating that all these years later, then Seymour Hirsch just comes out with something that that you know, sort of seemed to have been rather well known, actually. Parts of it, anyway. Yeah. And now I think, as far as the burial at sea. Nobody has really contradicted that except him, as far as you know, as far as I know, major journalists on the record with sources contradicting that. But I don't know anybody who believes it. That they just dumped his body in the ocean and that was the end of that? No way. And yeah. you know, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and say my kooky theory. I think that they cut his head off and brought it to the skull and bones crypt at Yale. Like Geronimo's skull. They even call them Geronimo. I think that he, I think his head was George Bush's prize. I'm just making that up. You understand? Old I temporary. That. that was his skull and bones name, temporary. But you know, Bush had said, and this part is supposedly not disputed, as far as I know, that Bush had told Kofor Black back in 2001, "Bring me his head in a box on dry ice," and that that was the initial order to kill him and cut his head off and bring it back to the bushes. There, you know, his grandfather. Uh, even got sued for digging up Geronimo's corpse and stealing his skull. Yeah, I, you know, I, hey, Scott, can as I? As long <laughs> as I'm, as long as I'm gonna say crazy stuff, I'm gonna try yeah. to back it up a little bit. And All I right. again admit that I just totally making that up. I just believe it. Yeah, it's <laughs> by the way not crazy. I've read the book about skull and bones. I, I mean, you know. Yeah, me too, Sutton. I, yeah, yeah, Sutton's yeah. funny, funny <laughs> book. I mean, he makes too much of a big deal out of it, and all these conspiracy yeah. theories are, are a little bit wacky, and yet. Like weirdly true too. So you know, um, I I don't know. I tend to think of cons these kinds of conspiracy theories as not so much dark and brooding and and scary and ominous, but just sort of a description of the way the ruling class works. You know, I mean, it's it's rather plain. If the ruling class doesn't imagine that they're really involved in some dark conspiracy to to destroy the world. They just think that. You know, they're they're living out Aristotle's politics, basically. They just think the elite should rule through through lies, and and there should be entrenched hierarchies, and they're on the top, and they're the philosopher kings, and everybody else is right. in a position of subjection. What's the problem? Basically, I mean, yeah. What's the problem? That otherwise <clears throat> we'd have chaos. I mean, that's sort of the way they think of it, and you gradually ascend up the ranks of the ruling class and get, you know, revealed more and more information, and you know, so and and yeah, so skull and bones is. Kind of one of the central central gatherings of the ruling class is not. Here's the other well, problem with this sort of. Stuff. You think it still uh, is or was? Well, I mean, certainly they believe they are. Um, but there are I many. My best information about them was a long time ago, though. You know. Yeah. Well, there are many centers of the of the ruling class, but um, the other the other mistake that a lot of these sort of um, birchy, um, cranky conspiracy theorists make, is they think that the problem is the skull and bones, or the, the, the problem is the trilateral commission, or the real problem is the Bilderbergers, or whatever. Mm. But at, actually, these are just kind of um, vessels, you know? I mean, the real problem is the ruling class, you know? I mean, these are just sort of central yeah, empire. Gathering. You know, it's not, it's not as if, you know, oh, we get rid of skull and bones, we get rid of the problem of the ruling class. <laughs> right. You know? The, hey, can, let me ask you something. Trillion dollar a year state, either. Right. Well, let me ask you something. Um, as long as you're uh, willing to go out on a limb and, and um, talk about uh, crazy stuff, I wonder if you could give me your very frank and very well-informed uh, opinion, if you're willing, 
on on Bin Laden's uh, personal culpability in the events of 9-11. I think he did it. What do you mean he did it? What does that actually mean? Well, so he inherited the, the group from Afghanistan that was the Azam group. Abdul Azam was the leader of the group, and he was killed, and Bin Laden took it over. And he merged his group with Egyptian Islamic Jihad, which was Ayman al-Zawahiri, the doctor's group. And so I don't know exactly, I forget now, I guess, exactly at what point the two groups more or less became one. But the group that started off in America attacking, they, they assassinated Rabbi uh, Kahane. Do you remember him, the yeah. right-wing nationalist, really a fascist uh, Israeli rabbi? They assassinated him in 1989. And then that was the start of it. It was the same little group that then blew up the World Trade Center, uh, which the FBI could have stopped but failed to stop. That's maybe another story. Uh, and then the same group had the plan to blow up the UN, the Lincoln Tunnel, and the Holland Tunnel, and all of that. Um, and then supposedly bin Laden's name first surfaces in counterterrorism around then that he was donating to the defense fund for these guys in the Lincoln and Holland Tunnel and UN plot. And then later they prosecuted uh, Youssef the bomber for the World Trade Center. Anyway, so that's when his name first starts surfacing as, you know, financing all of this. But then in 1996, he issued this fatwa, and he did interviews with CNN, uh, with Peter Arnett and Peter Bergen, and then later with John Miller of ABC News and uh, a couple of others. And he explained that basically you guys are the target because you guys are behind everything that we're fighting against. And so shortly after that was the attack on the Kobar Towers um, in Saudi Arabia, which killed 19 American airmen. And um, I don't know if there's a way to turn that. Oh, there is a way to turn the sound off on there. Um, and then uh, they blew up the embassies in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and Nairobi, Kenya in uh, 1998. And then they, they did uh, an attempted attack on a battleship that failed because the dinghy sank. Uh, but then they did blow up the coal in the year 2000, although they failed at their LAX plot because a, a Border Patrol agent at the Canadian border uh, near Vancouver got lucky and just said, boy, you're, it's pretty cold out here and you're sweating, Arab guy. You want to open your trunk for me there, buddy? And looked in his trunk and there was explosives and a map to LAX and all of this stuff. So that got busted. And so, you know, in other words, like, these guys are a real movement. They'd been around, they'd been attacking the United States for a long time. And it was the same uh, meeting, actually, in Malaysia where they planned the coal attack that they planned the 9-11 attack, or at least, you know, not down to every nitty-gritty or whatever, but that was the big part of the Malaysia you meeting. Think, you think that uh, Bin Laden was actually involved in selecting... Uh, the guys who flew the planes, and he had, you know, complete uh, foreknowledge. I think partially because there's video of two, uh, there's video of the lead hijacker, Mohammed Atta, and his buddy, Ramzi bin Rashid, in Afghanistan with bin Laden. And I okay. guess it's possible that George Lucas, you know, whipped up some industrial light and magic, but I don't believe so. And that, you know, the story was this group of, of would-be terrorists living in Hamburg, Germany, went to Afghanistan to train, and then they were noticed because they had Western passports and, and were working on advanced degrees. And so, we, you know, would have a chance to be allowed inside the United States. And yeah. so we're selected. And there's some good books about this. You know, I never read the 9-11 Commission report this whole time. But there are books by uh, Peter Lance wrote A Thousand Years for Revenge. There's uh, uh, James Bamford wrote A Pretext for War and The Shadow Factory, uh, both with impeccable sourcing. Uh, leading up to that, there's uh, uh, Perfect Soldiers by Terry McDermott, the biography of the Hamburg cell of the hijackers. And yeah, now there's huge scandal and huge cover-up in the fact that the CIA did not tell the FBI about real-ass Al-Qaeda in the country who did the attack. And in fact, for that matter, um, I don't know this, again, because I never read it myself, but my understanding is the letters NSA don't even appear in the 9-11 Commission report. And that's mm -hmm. only because if they told the, the, the truth about it, it would be, you know, there would have to be trials because of the amount of data, uh, you know, very important stuff on Al-Qaeda that the NSA was not sharing with the CIA or the FBI. And you think, All I these mean... these guys hate each other, you know? Yeah. 
So, I mean, there's there's huge scandal in that. And in fact, here's one more scandal that uh, that I think, you know, kind of all the silly stuff obscures. And that is that Rudy Giuliani put the emergency command center at Building Seven at World Trades at the World Trade Center, the most obvious terrorist target in America that it had already been attacked with a truck bomb, and Everyone, every professional tried to stop him and tried to get him to put it in Brooklyn or Queens or somewhere far away. And he said, no, nah, I want to be able to walk there from my office. Yeah. So he put the damn command center right there. Well, so what are the consequences of that? The consequences of that are all the dead firefighters. Because you can hear the audio from the police helicopters saying, whoa, man, the top is all moving around and creaking and is, you know, unstable. Everybody out, all NYPD out of the building right now. It's coming down. Well, there was nobody at the emergency command center which had been evacuated to turn around and tell that to the firefighters who were on a different frequency because Rudy Giuliani was forced to go parade around in the street like a hero when he was actually, what, parading around, doing nothing, and uh, unable to, to uh, coordinate the information that the police and their helicopter had above with the firefighters inside the building, uh, yeah. which cost them time that many of them could have used to get out of the building. So that's a major scandal, right? Like, that's the kind of thing where all things being equal, Giuliani's head would have rolled over that. But instead, everybody's running around chasing every kind of ridiculous conspiracy about it. And you know what? I'll say this for the conspiracy stuff. And I should have said this in the first place, I guess. I suspect that the uh, Saudi intelligence agency or agencies were you know, working to make sure this thing was successful. And I think uh, I give it at least some kind of double-digit chance that Dick Cheney and the Republicans had an understanding with the Saudis that we're gonna do this, we're gonna let the the first attack through so that we can get on with it and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Well, but it, I can't it, prove it, that, it, and it, mostly I can't because all the good information is buried under a bunch of nonsense. So now I've made myself an enemy of every 9/11 truther, but that's my. Well, favorite. you know these. Uh, you know it's funny. I I I bumped into there's there's a group of 9/11 truthers in. Uh, in Atlanta, I believe. I, I think they they exist in every in every town. Um, and you know, they're, they're nice people. They're they're they actually have sort of a passion for for justice, and they 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 want to know the truth. Uh, and I I actually think that everybody, even the leadership, the intellectual leadership of the 9/11 Truth movement, is deeply sincere. You know. Um, um, so I, I don't know enough about it, and and but I see, you know, what happens is if there's enough incomplete information, people get carried away, and start weaving, you know, wild wild tales when really the the truth is is usually one of incompetence, um, and misinformation and miscommunication, and to some extent some moral culpability for failure to share intelligence. That's more or less the story of Pearl Harbor, for example, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I'll tell you, my, my very favorite 9-11 truther is a guy named Ray Nowaleski. And I'm sorry, I'm sure I'm saying his name wrong. It's one of them Polish names. But it's something like Nowaleski. And uh, in fact, he's friends with the wife, and, and she helped produce. Uh, for those not familiar, my wife, Larissa Alexandrovna, uh, was an investigative reporter for many years for rawstory.com, mostly in the Bush years. Um, but anyway, uh, so she helped make the documentary 9-11 Press for Truth which is the story of the Jersey girls who pushed to get the 9-11 Commission investigation and all that. Well, Ray Noaleski was one of the guys who worked on that. Well, then he went further, and he did sequels to Press for Truth. And I think they're just called the Rich Blee Podcasts, Podcast 1 and Podcast 2. And one of them is video. The other is audio. But... Um, I mean, they get really way down into the nitty-gritty of just how much the CIA knew and just what. They, they confront Richard Clark, the White House head of counterterrorism, with what they can prove George Tenet knew and when. And mm -hmm. Richard Clark is basically, you know, upset and is saying, hey, look, there's nothing I can tell you other than he lied to me, the, the director of Central Intelligence. He lied to me. We'd be up at 3 o'clock in the morning talking about Al-Qaeda on the phone all night long, and he never told me. He had three real-ass Al-Qaeda in the country all along that I needed to know about, you know, and this kind of thing. And um, 
it's really worth watching. And Rich Blee is the name of the guy who was... I forget. If, I don't know if he was the head at that point or at some point. I think at that point he was the head of the CIA's Bin Laden unit because Michael Scheuer had been banished to the library uh, be, for getting mad at Sandy Berger for thwarting every attempt to kill Bin Laden back in the 90s. And so Scheuer was banished to the library. Civil servants never get fired. They just have to go sit in the library. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, so it was this guy, Rich Blee, was, was part of the... That's why it's called that, Rich Blee, B-L-E-E. -E. And I highly recommend that stuff to everybody. And anyway, but I had a talk with Noaleski one time, and I asked him, uh, you know, please, just break it down, cut through all the fog. I'm tired of all the fog. Just what really, why in the world get to the nitty-gritty? Why didn't the CIA tell the FBI about these CIA, the, the uh, Al-Qaeda guys in the country so that the FBI could stop them? And what he, his, he said, his Occam's razor best explanation is that the CIA panicked because they should have told the FBI all about the Malaysia meeting, and they didn't. And mm. now I forget in the timeline. Maybe the Malaysia meeting came later, but it involved some of the guys from the coal. Or maybe it came before, and that was where they planned for the coal and 9-11. I forget now, Jeff. It's been a little while. But anyway, the point being that the FBI in the 90s was in charge of all the Al-Qaeda investigations, you know, as criminal prosecutions, the embassies and the coal. Were, were treated, uh, were, were turned over to the FBI. And um, so basically Noaleski was saying that if the CIA had admitted to the FBI that they, what they knew about al-Qaeda in America, they would have had to admit to them what they knew about the Malaysia meeting and right. basically that, that if they had told them about the Malaysia meeting in time, they may have been able to stop the coal attack. Something along those lines. So basically, it was an inter-bureaucratic cover your ass, is yeah. what it was. And so, well, when it came to having real ass Al Qaeda terrorists in the country, the CIA left the FBI in the dark for a year and a half. Well, and there's, isn't there also a problem? I, I I don't know what it what it what it looks like to be you know inside uh, government under these conditions, you know, in these high posts in government. But um, I mean, isn't it the case that like every single day there's just a massive flurry of Information coming at you, some credible, some not. You know the the you know you don't you don't know what's actually a threat and and what's just a rumor. What what seems to be just like a run of the mill daily problem and what actually amounts to something serious. It becomes very obvious after the fact. You know like what you should have known and what you should have shared and what you should have done. But day to day, I I I mean I I can't even imagine what it must be like. You know to be, you know. Uh, you know, the Secretary of State, and get your daily briefing, you know, from the CIA and the FBI and the NSA. Um, you know, there's probably just pages of, of stuff in there. And, and after a while, your eyes begin to glaze over. I mean, isn't this one of the problems? Of the, unlike insurance companies, you know, who make a business of, of risk assessment, mm -hmm. uh, the state, it's just just a kind of a constant stream of, 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 of data coming at you all the time. And I would, I would think it would be very difficult to separate the the real threats from just, you know, the usual nonsense. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right, and I think, you know, not to let these guys off the hook. People always get me wrong, like I'm trying to let these guys off the hook for calling them stupid, for saying instead of a grand design of an evil conspiracy of Middle East policy, that mostly it's a bunch of idiocy. I don't mean to acquit the people in charge. Uh, you know, it's all mendacious stupidity, I mean, if that helps, uh, you know. Uh, but there are a lot of times where, and I guess, you know, I really don't know either, Jeff, but it does seem, and hey, I guess some legit experts on my show have, uh, have said in the past that, yeah, I mean, the kind of discussions that we have on my show, where say I'm interviewing Patrick Coburn about the war in Iraq, something like that, that that a lot of times would be a much better discussion than yeah. would take place at the principal level. I mean, maybe oh, I the deputy probably. undersecretary of something has that kind of talk with his staff. But by the time the story gets up to Clinton, and exactly. here's what we're saying, and here's what we're thinking, it's already just a bunch of crap. So, like, for example, and this is a great example, our government has been backing the bad guys, simple as that, in Syria uh, from 2011 on. The, you know, the, the Mujahideen war against Assad, that includes the al-Nusra Front and now the Islamic State. And so there has to be people... In the government, in fact, Fox News just came out and said, oh, we have a DIA report where they warned about the rise of the Islamic State. 
there are people way down on the on the chain complaining but about it. They don't it. make it all the way up but, to the top. I mean, yeah, it doesn't make it up. So, yeah, so by need, the time the executive summary doesn't uh, doesn't typically you know foretell the the, the future. Right. And, and, and it's just so easy to picture the conversation when it's yeah. Obama and Hillary Clinton and the National Security yeah. Advisor, and basically it's a it's a uh, an exercise in. So this is what we're saying, right? Uh huh. This is what we're saying, and so then this is yeah. what we're going to do, right? Uh huh. Uh huh. And it's all about this consensus building. And there's nobody there to say, wait a minute, man. I mean, Jabba al Nusra is already running around chopping people's heads off and suicide bombing school full of schools full of women and children. Are you sure that they're the lesser evil in this war? If we got to pick one side, it's got to be them. This is crazy. Nobody's yeah. saying that at that level. Whereas yeah. on my show, week after week, I'm talking with the very best reporters in the world about this, and they're saying to me, "I know, man. I, <laughs> you know, it's crazy, yeah. but yeah." That's, they yeah, are. Al Nusra is Al Qaeda in Syria, and our guns are in their hands. Sorry. And you know? part of the problem is that the state doesn't have, uh, you know, sort of sort of ownership over its job in providing security. I mean, it's 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 a job that that they're assigned through sort of civic responsibility, but it's not one that's really tied to any kind of um, profitability metric or. Uh, scientific approach, so they can choose to take whatever whatever information they want to, act on whatever they want to, they disregard whatever they want to, and there's there's really no way that they have, uh, you know, as I say, unlike an insurance company, you know, or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, well, um, Rumsfeld famously said, Rumsfeld famously said, we lack the metrics, right? We yeah. we lack even the the tool to measure whether we're creating more enemies than we're destroying, mm -hmm. right? But for any of us on the outside, we're going, come on, man, this whole thing, obviously you're creating more enemies than you're destroying, you know? Right. But they, they wonder, how do we even begin to measure this? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and your point about consensus building is very interesting to me, too, because um, uh, that, that's really what it comes down to. I mean, I, have you ever been involved in a, in a game of, of, of trivia where you sit around you're on a team of, like, four people? And um, there will be a trivia question asked, you know, and 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 you'll get a choice of uh, three three possible things. You kind of more or less know the right answer, but you're among four people, and there's one person that's kind of passionate that you're wrong. Mm. Um, I mean, you very quickly give in. You're like, yeah, I'm sure. I'm, yeah, I'm probably wrong, you know. That might be me. Yeah, the, the, the <laughs> yeah. guy that you give into. No. <laughs> and then the right, and then the answer is revealed, and it turns out you're right. And your team picked the wrong answer, mm -hmm. um, and you're like, "Yeah, should have just gone with my instincts here, you know." But it's not sort of not worth it to you to to fight, right. you know. And this this is this kind of mistakes and consensus building happen at at the smallest level in in, in society, you know, every day, unless there's a real profitability metric at stake, you know. Yep. Uh, if if you're Tiffany, if you're running, if you're in charge of security at at, at Tiffany. You know, you've got a very strong incentive uh, and and a lot of metrics that are that are constructed around the the, the likelihood of of threats. So you approach to everything very different from. It's like government is about like being a part of a like government intelligence is like being being in a in a casual tri trivia game in your in your subdivision. You know, nobody really has the strong reason to be right. You know, and there's no real great consequence to being wrong. Yep. Got that right. Hey, I want to ask you some things. Yeah. Uh, my understanding is that every war in the 20th century, well, every major war, I won't count every time they invaded and massacred a bunch of people in Latin America, but uh, every major war in the 20th century, excluding Korea, the Federal Reserve blew up a gigantic bubble of artificial prosperity to cover the cost of the war and to disguise the consequences uh, when they came later. And I wonder whether uh, you know uh, much about that as well. Yeah, I mean, of course, it, it all began in, in World War One, And the studies of this actually came out, like, right after the war because, you know, as you know, uh, the entire uh, Western world looked back at World War One and said, that was the stupidest thing that's ever happened. You know, how did it happen? Where did it come from, and what can we do to prevent it again? I mean, there's a tremendous amount of war revisionism. Like, immediately after the war ended, like, holy shit, you know, we were building this beautiful world in the late 19th century, and we decided to blow it up. 
you know, a tremendous cost and not much benefit. You know, how did this happen? So uh, immediately the economists got to um, start, uh, and and uh, I think his name is William Anderson. Uh, it was one of the first uh, studies that came out on this. That basically demonstrated that the entire thing was was made possible through the central banks. You know, they had reckless politicians that were that uh, suddenly, for the first time in history, you know, all faced a kind of unlimited funding uh, that they could do the war or not, but it wasn't going to cost them in terms of tax revenue. They could just um, go into deep debt and fund the debt through through uh, through the central bank, and it was this egregious kind of moral hazard that was created as a result of the central bank, and I don't believe that the U.S. would have ever entered into World War One were it not for the creation of the Federal Reserve. Um, so that was a result, I mean, that was a, that's directly connected. And it's true, of course, even in the case of um, uh, Russia's involvement in that war, that if it weren't for the Russian central bank, that it never would have engaged in this protracted struggle and draft with Germany and created a hyperinflation and therefore inspired the revolution that created Soviet communism. I mean, it, like, everything sort of flows out of the central bank. I mean, it's, it's like the original sin, in many ways, of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. I mean, much worse than anything else that ever happened. And it certainly happened in World War II, and Vietnam was made possible through this way, and, and even in modern times, uh, you know, Iraq, um, and God, I mean, the 2008 financial crisis is directly traceable to Federal Reserve policy following 9-11. Mm -hmm. Well, know? you know, Reagan's Reagan's arms build up and Bill Clinton's expansion of the empire after, you know, it should have been the peace dividend time. Both of those seem like, you know, the same kind of thing at play, too. Uh, now, what know, was the after, first thing you said about Ronald Reagan's uh, build up? But, I mean, that was much earlier, right? I mean, you're talking yeah, about well, that was, after the cold I mean, branded. Right, so I forget. When did they kick Volcker out of there? It was like 83 okay. or 84 they yeah. finally lowered interest rates? Yeah. And started building so up the next very. Bar. Yeah, it's a very interesting thing because, because you know, of course, we went off the gold standard in 1974 and unleashed this this hell, right? So Nixon suddenly is using price and wage controls. We suddenly had an inflation plus a recession, you know, creating st you know, stagflation, so-called, which wasn't supposed to happen under Keynesian theory. Uh, everything got worse and worse throughout the 1970s. We had the great malaise, you know, and then and then we had the actual serious inflation by American standards, you know, double digit, which which you know, looted American savings and, and just caused so many disasters. Um, Volcker was appointed by Carter and then operated under a kind of Chicago-style monetary theory. He said, well, you know, look, if you want to get rid of the inflation, you've got to stop the printing presses. I mean, you know, it's kind of an amazing thing in retrospect that that actually happened. Like, we can't even imagine that happening now. Just nobody even thinks like that anymore. You know, like, interest rates can't be too low anymore. But Volcker was actually a, like a more or less uh, responsible um, central banker. He sort of saved the system from itself. And so inflation plummets, but of course we had a deep recession. And we had a real correction. So Reagan becomes president. It's, it's fascinating at the time because um, his, his position was we have to allow the recession to play itself out. We have to get all this malinvestment washed out of the system. We have to get all these bad investments you know, gone. Um, all the distortions in the economic structure that are created as a result of uh, central bad, bad central bank policy have to allow themselves to wash themselves out. And once that happens, we'll be on the road to recovery. You know, all good, all very good instincts, right? <clears throat> but um, it didn't last long. So as soon as that period was over, and it happened very quickly, you know, I think by 1983 the recession was... Um, uh, we were on onward to a growth path, and things were looking really impressive. Um, yeah, as the Reagan administration used the newfound stability, prosperity, and cleared markets, you know, um, and the capital that the central bank had uh, permitted to be uh, built up over the last over the previous three years of recession, two years of recession, to embark on yes, a massive inflationary monetary policy that was just pure military Keynesianism. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, and that's what fueled, you know, the the so-called prosperity of the of the of the of the nineteen nineteen eighties. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it I mean, like that it was really kind of undercut the imperative to give the American people their peace dividend after the end of the Cold War when well, and that Bill Clinton's was, that bubble was, came in. That was one of the most egregious times in my life, right? I mean, 
uh, Scott, it was such a shock because I had been raised in the Cold War and I more or less believed. Like, I disagreed with it, but I thought that the reason why we had to put sort of liberty on hold and had to first all cutting the budget and, and having a balanced budget and having sound economic policies was because of the Soviet threat. Like, like I, I kind of disagreed with that, but I thought that was the actual thinking, you know? So when the Soviet Union just like, like practically overnight just like vanishes and all these governments are collapsing all over Eastern Europe and the, and the 40 year uh, Cold War just suddenly just like evaporates, uh, you know, from the planet. Um, it seemed like an, an absolute no-brainer. Now is the time. You dramatically cut the, 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 the military budget, as happened after World War II, actually, and um, return, the, return the money to, to the American people. And, and, you know, what was funny about that was that the right, the right wing, uh, the Republican Party, wasn't really hip to this idea at all. In fact, there was a, a great deal of um, hysteria at the time, like, oh, the, the threats are still out there. In fact, they're, they're worse than ever, you know. Uh, there's new threats emerging. We can't let up on peace through strength and so on. The, the people who were most uh, making the most sense at the time were people like Jesse Jackson, actually. You know, there was a big movement on the left, as you said, for, for the peace dividend. Now, they didn't imagine it would come in the form of tax cuts. What they wanted to do was convert military spending to kind of domestic welfare and stuff like that, which in a sense would have been actually a better policy, you know. <laughs> Whatever is wrong with domestic welfare, it's less destructive you know, than, than um, you know, endless military buildup. But what was amazing about that whole thing, I mean, in retrospect, it's just astounding to think of how the ruling class just kind of like, like, like doubled down, you know, yeah, and just go to Iraq. Yeah, and just pushed through and, and figured, look, we'll find another threat, we'll, we'll find another war, we'll invent another ruse, uh, the American people are stupid, they'll forget, you know, let's let two or three years go by, and uh, it'll be a, a you know a new world, and we'll just kind of keep keep going on. You know, it, it's 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 amazing, and it's a measure of the unbelievable irresponsibility of that generation of 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 the ruling class. Because like I said, after World War One, there were massive uh, uh, cuts, right? After mm -hmm. World War Two, huge you know dramatic shift in national spending priorities, um, and huge budget cuts, but not at the end of the Cold War. I mean, it was just there were too many uh, people winning from the military establishments that existed to even consider cutting it back, and uh, uh, it was it was an it was an egregious situation. Now, let's just say in a perfect world we hadn't had a central bank. I mean, there wouldn't have been an argument. I mean, there would have been dramatic cuts all over the place. There had to have been because you can't possibly tax people um, to fund the level of leviathan that we actually live. You know now. what, though, Jeff? How do you get... And it's funny, because this has been my thing since I started on radio in 1998. Was If only I can get all of America to understand about the relationship between central banking and war, and yet, what an obscure thing. I mean, for the it's, Ron Paulians and the, and the hardcore libertarians, we understand. But how do you get the American people to understand that, listen, if they had to raise your taxes, you'd kill them with pitchforks. So instead, they print the money... <laughs> And you spend all your time in the unemployment line eight years later, wondering why your life sucks, and that's your cost of the war. And so, what? Hate central banking with us now or something? I don't get. What do we do? How do we get people to get it? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't even think there's much hope for that. Actually, I mean, like Ron, you know, was, he engaged in a kind of a, you know, a really wonderful campaign to, to push this, you know, and. Uh, the book and the Fed, you know, just hammered the point, you know, over and over again, you know, from the first page to the last, that there's this relationship between the loss of liberty and central banking. But I don't know. I mean, it's like it's like this. It's like you said, it's a little too complicated. It takes too many steps, you know, of thinking to get people to understand this. Oh, sorry. so just barely I, though. Too many steps by like one. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on. I don't know. Maybe if you get the right movie stars or, or rock stars to talk about it or something. You know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah, and this is why I think the that... The crash is the correction. Like, someone make a lyric out of that. Yeah. Well, you know, F.A. Hayek dealt with this whole problem in his own life. If you read his Denationalization of Money monograph in 1974, it's, it's really a fascinating uh, kind of study of a 
you know, just an extraordinarily brilliant man who had spent his, I mean, like an astonishingly amazing thinker, who had spent his entire life trying to alert people and on, uh, you know, in the UK, you know, and continental Europe, <coughs> and later in the US, about the dangers of, of central banking and the urgency for monetary reform. So 1974 comes along, he's already got the Nobel Prize, he's like, well, the hell with it, I'm just going to tell the truth. And um, his conclusion was that reform, uh, it just can't happen because the ruling class is too wedded to an inflationary monetary policy, and so long as that exists, to his mind, there's no, essentially no practical hope for freedom at all. So that's when he first concocted this idea of a, of a, of a ground up, uh, sort of a, a, a bottom up um, monetary reform where people just start using a better, more advanced form of currency. Mm -hmm. um, he imagined it would initially be uh, uh, issued by banks and he, he talks about this. I mean, it's very interesting. He has like what I would consider to be an entrepreneurial plan. I mean, he has, he has banks issuing their own currency and he thinks that people would start accepting it in the event of a monetary crisis because it performs much better and it's much more reliable than national currencies and that eventually this private currencies will outcompete uh, failed government currencies and we get a, a monetary reform by default, not top down because the ruling class doesn't want it, you know, but, but bottom up because people want a sound money in their own uh, financial interest. So anyway, I tell that story because um, this is why I'm so hopeful about cryptocurrency. You know, um, you know, Bitcoin was only invented six years ago, and it's like everybody's sitting around going, oh, well, where's the magic? You know, well, how come, how come uh, your brilliant uh, Bitcoin hasn't overthrown the nation state yet? Well, the, all I can say is these things take time. Yeah, and, we're and, working on it. Yeah, we're working on it. And, and, you know, the other thing is that we haven't really had a monetary crisis uh, since 2008. I mean, Bitcoin was invented and, in, uh, you know, the Genesis block came out in 2009. But, you know, you can see what's happening to Bitcoin in Argentina today. I mean, there's a great story that came out in the Wall Street Journal, which I think was, or maybe it was the New York Times, but it's an excerpt from a new book on the history of Bitcoin um, that has swept the country. I mean, everything, you know, cars, from, cars and houses, I began to see this two years ago. Cars and houses and savings and everything that's kept in Bitcoin has become a real national currency, an alternative. Um, well, if that same kind of situation happens in the U.S., we could see a flight into cryptocurrency like we've never seen before. And we could get our monetary fund. All I'm saying is that I see, here's the thing. It's like there's more hope today for this dream of a private currency than we've had in a hundred years. That doesn't mean it's, it's guaranteed to happen or it's going to happen next week, you know. But we have a greater degree of hope now than we've had in a hundred years of bad monetary policy, so at least now we have an option uh, should the time come where we need to use it. Right. Yeah, no, and, and there's a lot of people around the world, uh, well, everybody's got some kind of crappy paper currency to deal with, so there's going to be crises here and there. And Yeah, I just think it's extremely significant. You know, I, I think it's, uh, it's something like the invention of cryptocurrency. It's just, plus it's a global currency. It's private. It's not managed by central banks. It's utterly transparent. You know, it's it's run by a protocol instead of by a bunch of politically appointed uh, criminals, um, and you know, bloviators or whatever. Um, I think it's extremely significant. I mean, to me, it's like if you think about what did the invention of email mean for the post office over the long term? You know, initially people said, "Well, I'll never replace the post office." Now everybody just laughs at the post. I mean, I go to my mail every day. You know. And mostly what I get is, you know, just junk mail. In fact, by my mailbox, there's a huge trash bin that's yeah. entirely full of, uh, of trash, you know, flyers. It's basically subsidized by, by the government for the corporate class to send you junk mail. You know, that's yep. that's what the mails are used for, you know. Um, uh, and so, you know, it. but it took time uh, for this to, to happen. So if you think about cryptocurrency and its relationship to national currency, I like to think about, you know, our communication technologies we have now, instant messaging and SMS and, you know, this Google Hangouts, whatever, relative to the only way we had to communicate in the old days, which was through uh, the government. I think, it's, I think it's actually much more significant because when you're talking about money, you're not just talking about one service or one sector. It's not like shoes or, or, or vegetables or something like that. It's half of every single economic transaction, you know? 
So to to invent a new form is is really uh, I, I think a, a real hinge of history. Um, and I don't know if that means it's necessarily a Bitcoin, but but I think we have a greater hope now for monetary reform than ever before. As for political reform of, the, of central banking, I just I don't believe it. I don't believe it'll ever happen. Yeah, no, I mean, you just have periodic well, then, crises. I guess they could completely destroy the currency, but then they'd just be replaced by a different central bank is all. But, you know, isn't it... But I, there is something interesting about all this, because we, we talked about about um, Volcker and the, the Reagan, the early Reagan years. You know, the fact that we had something like a political culture that would have tolerated um, a, sh a shutdown of the inflation machine and a, and and a culture that 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 tolerated allowing the recession to happen. You know, as if everybody understood. Yeah, we we made a lot of mistakes in the past, so now we're gonna have to suffer for a little while so we can get on a sound growth path. I mean, that's not a complicated. The story it seems to me, but it's a story that 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 nobody has told in this country for mm -hmm. uh, since that time. I mean, it's been like 30 years since since uh, any national politicians told the truth about about uh, about economic life and the business cycle and the central bank. I mean, wh why mm -hmm. is the truth so completely banned these days? I mean, well, after 2008, it would have been I mean, so easy say something like, look, we overinflated the economy, now we're going to have to go through a recession. But nobody was willing to say this. Like, oh my god, recession, you know, let's just, um, th but surely there's some lever somewhere here in Washington where we can make this thing go away. And we're going to well, do it, seems it like, like They didn't just paint themselves into a corner, right? They paint themselves to the edge of a cliff, where mm -hmm. if they raise interest, like, interest rates like Volcker did back then, right. then just the interest on the national debt every year would be enough to break the entire national it government. It would be catastrophic. Budget. And so it just, yeah. just came over. All they can do is just keep adding zeros to the denominator, basically, and just keep printing dollars. Yeah. You know, on yeah. until, you know, the apocalypse. Well, you know, I'm, I'm running an we'll article. Be funded by central banking, too. I'm, I'm running an article tomorrow on the Foundation of Economic, uh, uh, Foundation of Economic Education website by, by Robert Murphy, in which you know, decisively proves, I think, Mm -hmm. that all the economic policies since 2008 and 9 uh, have been like a complete flop. Uh, I mean, it's, it's like been a devastating refutation of Keynesianism, mm -hmm. you know? Even by Paul Krugman standards, it's, it's been a, a disaster. And yet, people still look at it and go, oh, that wasn't that great. You know, I mean, Krugman's still out there defending everything, you know? It's, we live in times that's... That's in the same way we were unable to face reality about U.S. foreign policy. It's the same thing with domestic policy. It's like it's like we live in a new age of faith, you know, where we just we just have to believe the state, you know, is wonderful and glorious and doing the right thing all the time and has no bad effects whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And then it's, it, throw the bums out every eight or four years if necessary to keep the illusion going and switch off, you know, which half of the country is more or less satisfied and which half is more or less angry for a little while and then switch back again. And it works perfectly. And you know, the thing with the boom and the bust, it's the perfect illusion for a regular person who's not thinking hard about it and is just kind of living their life and looking at it. It seems like what happens is the economy's fine and then it gets bad. And then it gets fine again and then it gets bad again. And they're not seeing it as an artificial high that then comes the bust is the correction. They just, you know, you could basically fill in any mythology in the why it is that now all of a sudden everybody quit spending money. I don't know why, but they all just did. And um, that's because that's just how it looks from, you know, the shopkeeper's level or whatever like that. So it's sort of like, again, with central banking and war. How do you get the average person to understand that? You know, in fact, the closest, the closest I know to that is a Bob Murphy quote. I was going to bring this up earlier where he says, you know, Scott, all you're complaining about central banking and war. That's a big part of the argument for having a central bank. What if there's a war? We can't have a gold standard. What if we want to kill a bunch of people? And so, and that's expensive. And so we'll have to inflate for that, right? Yeah. And that's the only where that's the only place where you can get to kind of conventional wisdom on the issue is the people who that's why they favor it, <laughs> so that we can have war all the time. You know, as, how you to know, get people to oppose it for those reasons is beyond me. I don't know. Yeah. There's a lot of reasons for war. I tonight before before we we talked, I was reading uh, 
Aristotle's Politics. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to read it. It's it's a very interesting sort of urtext of of the the Western political um, vision in a way. I mean, it's as as egregious as it is brilliant. You know, so you know it's 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 uh, you know obviously his pro-slavery stuff is 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 well known, but but his you know, presumption of the complete absence of individual rights is fascinating. I mean, reading a text like this makes you really grateful for the Enlightenment in many ways. And and there's other brilliant things in it. Like he's he's got a great attack on on Plato's collectivism, you know, which you know you're sort of grateful for in a way. But he has various um, points about war in there, and uh, essentially he loves war. I mean, he thinks war is just just wonderful and inevitable, and he sees war as the tool for becoming rich. That the purpose of war is is acquisition of wealth. And the only, to Aristotle's mind, the only real uh, meritorious or, or uh, viable way to gain more wealth for yourself is to be a member of the ruling class, go to war, and grab it from somebody else. That's how you become wealthy. And that's, and that's in his mind. He also thinks that war is very good for, uh, for a bringing out of the human personality, particularly men, um, uh, this, this great meritorious desire to rule and to exercise courage, and to be, you know, to, and, to, and to reveal commanding virtues in the human personality. So, I mean, you have this sort of systematic, you know, Sounds defense. like Bill Crystal in the Weekly Standard. It does. It really National does. National greatness conservatism. Exactly. It's that's exactly what it is. together. It's amazing. It's straight from, <clears throat> straight from Aristotle to the neoconservatives today. I mean, it's just, it's just one long line, bypassing the Enlightenment entirely, you know? So reading a book like Aristotle's Politics makes you love the liberal revolution, you know, of, uh, you know, of the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, and then finally the, the great age of laissez-faire, the 19th century, because we discovered the great truth, that we don't need all this crap in order to have a good life. We can actually have, you know, freedom, we can make money through peace and trade, and there can be a universal, universal dignity uh, for all human beings. I mean, that is like a, a beautiful and radical vision. It's so different uh, than anything you read in the ancient world or anything you read from modern status. Well, that's going on my pile of books I better read someday, I guess. It's, you, know, you can it's, see it back there. Heroin. <laughs> it's your eyes pop out, and you know it's what's funny about it is that it's extremely erudite. Uh, you don't feel like you're, you know, reading some weird ancient guy or whatever. Oh, it really cool. sounds like like a pundit on Fox News. Hey, listen, here's here's where I want to. Uh, oh no, I screwed up. Let me see here. Oh man, I didn't mean to click, but I clicked. Here we go. Uh, here's how I want to end the show uh, today, Jeff. Uh, uh, a, a comment from Tom in the chat room. I don't know, I guess you don't have your chat room open here, but a no. comment from Tom in the chat room. Uh, he says, I went to Iraq in 07 and Afghan in 11. We pretty much just protected a warlord's drugs for him. Certainly helped open my eyes to what is going on. The warlord is now dead. Suicide bomber. Live by the sword, as they say, he writes. So this is the American Empire, as he says here. Uh, helped open my eyes to what is going on. That's the face of the empire right there. Join up, serve your country, the few, the proud. Now stand there and protect this poppy field, right? And then what would be the opposite of that would be go ahead and kill this guy and all of his village because, you know, the competition poppy dealer doesn't like him anymore and we're going to call it the virtuous war on drugs, right? Like that's going to be as close as you get to... Uh, to being on the side of right occupying Afghanistan right there. That's the reality of the empire. And, you know, poor Tom, uh, you know, had to learn the hard way, live through it. Thank goodness he's back here safe and sound, apparently. But, uh, you know, the, the rest of the guys, the hundreds and hundreds of Americans, a thousand, more than a, a thousand Americans who've died over there in Afghanistan, they were on the same mission as him, more or less. That's basically the face of it. Imagine giving up your child to go and fight in a war that they sell you as some kind of honor and glory and value and defense of America and its freedom and all of this. And then he dies standing around guarding a poppy field. 
You know, when we all want to legalize opium for medical purposes anyway, man, what are we talking about? You know, this, what, why would it even be a, a prohibited, uh, you know, a black market operation in the first place that he would need all this outside protection? Uh, you know, only because we make it that way in the first place. I'm off on the tangent, but you understand. That's the corruption of empire. That's the reality of the empire right there is yeah. go and maybe kill people and get killed over nothing that you could ever talk yourself into if you had a chance to go back, you know? Uh, Scott, thank you so much for your amazing insights. Uh, and as I, again, I always use you as my cheat sheet. You know, it allows me to sort of get, get up on, on, on the news that I haven't bothered to read. So thank, thank you for your amazing insight and for your show. Scott Horton Show, anybody can get it by through Googling, right? Yeah, scotthorton.org. Yeah, scotthorton.org. And I'm from liberty.me. Uh, if you haven't signed up, do it hey, now. Hey, I am too. Yeah, you're from Friend me on there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I work for the Foundation for Economic Education also, fee.org. That's where I'm posting all the time. And I hope to see you, Scott, in the very near future, and thank you again. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, all the best, sir. See Bye-bye. That or not? Uh, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, assuming I can get it up and going, I'll keep an eye on it. Okay. I mean, I can pull it up too, but um, but I don't know. I mean, it just seems like the way this window is working, uh, it might be better for you. Um, we can take some questions in there. If you if you keep that chat window open, then and alert me to any questions, just interrupt me or whatever. That would be amazing. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So I can I, see it. I'll see if I can get it running here. So one of the amazing things about you, as I've often said, is that sometimes I can out outsource my brain to you, you know? So um, I'm hoping you can give me a full tutorial on this on this uh, Seymour Hersh uh, Bin Laden stuff, some of the background, some of what's been going on, because I know you've, I, I mean, I know you, so I know you've been following it very, very closely, right? Um, uh, where, yeah, as, of course. you know, I'm, I've been involved in all these other things going on, and I still haven't read the Hersh article, I have a, a vague outline of what's happening. I mean, how serious is this for for the empire? How credible is the story? What does it mean for uh, you know this the sort of historical narrative of of the U.S. you know uh, capture of, of Bin Laden? Well, so I think I want to start with that, and I'm still screwing around trying to get the chat room open here uh, while I'm okay. talking to you. But I think I want to start with that. The reaction to Hirsch. I mean, all you need to know is that there's the official story of the killing of Bin Laden and. Hirsch has come out with this piece that says that it's virtually entirely a lie, that that's not how it happened at all, that he died there that day, but other than that, it's all a bunch of bunk. And then the reaction to that is like he, you know, said that the Virgin Mary was in fact not a virgin at all, like, right? He had, he had gone straight at the heart of the civic religion of the state. I mean, what is it good for anyway? Well, they did hunt down and kill that one guy, finally. Right, and so we can cheer USA for that. And I don't know where they got the the students to come out in front of the White House and chant USA for that, but they found them. And um, it's hurtful, Jeff Tucker. It it's hurtful to say that something as as important and symbolic as the Navy SEALs, right, SEAL Team Six, and all this straight out of the comic book, that they went and got this guy in the way that they did. Um, in this, uh, you know, Jessica Lynch heroic, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, special forces raid kind of a way that they did. Does this all and, come from the movie? Does this all from the, the movie Z Zero Dark something? Sure, or? yeah. And I mean, the lies were tailor made for a movie, basically, right? This is, uh, uh, you know, basically to make up for the fact that everything they do makes our terrorism problem worse, at least they could say, well, we finally got that one guy for you, I guess. Anyway, the only point I'm getting at is look at the way they attack Hirsch. All right? I mean, no, none of these reporters ever attack each other like this for carrying on the state's narrative. But you challenge the state's narrative, and from a position of such authority as being Seymour Hirsch, who's, you know, the daddy of all real investigative journalists in this country, and they all know it. They all have to praise him before they attack him, even when they're attacking him. Um, it, it was, it's a huge thing. I mean, you know, his story that uh, Turkey and al-Nusra uh, were basically trying to frame up Assad for the Serenit gas attack of August 2013 um, that almost led to a war then, they basically just ignored that. 
And that was a big deal story. But they basically just ignored it right out of there. Let's just pretend that never happened, basically. That didn't make the TV news or whatever. But with this Bin Laden story, it uh, I guess I'm just repeating myself. But you can see how you know people in the media uh, just went completely crazy over this because they played the role of Mina Bird for whatever the state said happened there. And including, like you said, the Hollywood movie that depicts this entire thing. Uh, entirely different from the so what, truth. What, what is what is his what is his narrative and and how does it differ from differ from the okay so right, let's do it. okay so uh, the official story is that the CIA brilliantly tortured a guy and then that led to the name of a courier and then they tracked a courier to this Bin Laden safe house in Abbottabad and that uh, uh, the uh, the Americans basically just figured it out, deduced that he was there, and then knowing they couldn't trust the ISI that may or may not have been in on keeping him there, the ISI, that's the Pakistani CIA, basically, uh, they decided to send in the Special Forces, SEAL Team 6, in two Black Hawk helicopters to raid the place and kill the guy. There was a big firefight. They shot a bunch of couriers and bodyguards and whatever, and then all the details... They even from the very beginning they were raising and then dropping details as they were disproven and contradicted. But they said for a time he had hid behind his wife and that he had fired an AK-47 and all of this. So what Hirsch says is that basically none of that's true. He was living there, but he was living there because ISI was keeping him there under house arrest, and that one of their uh, top guys basically broke ranks and walked into the CIA and said, I know where Bin Laden is, give me the money and bring my, my family to America and I'll tell you where he is. And then he tipped them off. And that then, uh, they worked, they basically called out the Saudis, I mean, pardon me, the Pakistanis, and said, we know that you've been keeping him, and so now you're going to help us get him. And so then they went in and did the raid, but it was basically stage managed like the Jessica Lynch thing, where there was no opposition in sight. And the Pakistanis kept all the airplanes back and didn't do anything about the helicopters violating the air, their airspace and kept all the local police and local firefighters and local whatever first responders and, and that kind of thing back from the scene during the raid. They went in there and they shot him. And then instead of uh, dumping his body at sea, they actually, the, the, the uh, SEALs themselves were, according to Hirsch, kind of just joshing around and going, ha-ha, look at me, oops, I accidentally threw his hand out the door, hard for you to get a proper Islamic burial now, huh, chump, kind of thing, and that they were basically just desecrating his body through, through bits and pieces of it out the door, and then there's a discrepancy here because he says in the article, or at least his copy editor, Final Draft, says in the article, the body was last seen with the CIA and that the burial at sea on the Vinson never happened. The USS Vinson, Carl Vinson, never happened. Um, when I asked him about that, he said, I didn't write that. I don't know what you're talking about. Now i got to go. So oh, really? I don't know exactly, I guess. In fact, what he said was, no, it did go to the Vinson, but it didn't go into the water. Right. What do you mean when you, when you asked him about that? Did you have him on your show? Yeah, I had him on my show a week ago today. Oh, that's so incredibly cool. How did you uh, land that? I mean, you just wrote him? Well, yeah, I've kind of interviewed him off and on for the last 10 years because oh, he was wow. really good on, on the neocons and the Mujahideen Ecolk and all this great stuff back, you know, in 2005. And the that's wife is really friends cool. with him. And so, um, and now, so here's the thing, too. Uh, his story is partially corroborated by... Um, uh, Carlotta Gall from the New York Times, who says that was her information, too, that she never published, uh, but that she believed that the Pakistanis were keeping him there, basically under house arrest. Uh, 